Hello, everybody. My name is Roger, and this is the David Ace Group 16.3 Planning. With me today is Alex. Hello. Hey, Alex. So 16.3, the David Ace Group is offering at full capacity. Um, as usual, we'll have our upcoming absences listed on our weekly status update. And also, we just need to call out that about half the team's capacity is typically consumed by unplanned work. So we've got some priorities, but progress is generally going to be slow and steady across the board. Um, super high level, our focus is on initiatives that affect the availability and reliability of GitLab.com and self-managed instances. We have two particular areas that we've been working through for the last little while. Firstly, is our medium-term database scalability strategy. And secondly, which is a more recent focus for us, is the potential risk of lightweight lock contention. This happens when in times of high traffic, certain queries span a lot of tables and a lot of indexes, and that impacts our availability overall. And we believe that our query testing efforts here will help us navigate this balance. Alex, do you want to touch on a little bit more detail with either of these? Um, yeah, no, I think I think that pretty much sums it up. Uh, we're also working with the scalability team to institute some monitoring so that we can keep an eye on these locks in production and make sure we're not too far into the red there. Yeah. Uh, primarily, we're seeing this lot contention issue happen on uh, replicas right now and not so much on the primary. Um, well, less it's less impactful on the primary, which has been good. Um, one of the ways we may also be able to mitigate it is adding more replicas. So it's it's something that we're in. On, there are ongoing discussions with the database reliability team about how we want to tackle this as a whole. Um, but from our side, our efforts are focused on query testing. Cool. All right. So let's get into some of our top priorities. Um, some of these are recurring themes. Um, so first up here is talking about partitioning strategies and table ownership. This is part of our team's broader effort to reduce table sizes across all of GitLab. Um, definitely a few ways to go about it. In our preferred case, we just drop data we don't need. But in other cases, this is a viable solution. So we're trying to break these tables up into smaller bits. Alex, did you want to just go through a quick update here for where we've been? Yeah, you know, right now, we're mainly focused on helping. There, there are two kind of big areas, which are uh, working with teams directly in order to figure out how they want to partition their tables and then get them kind of get the ball rolling with them to get that partitioning happening. Uh, and then the other, and so that's what we've been doing with the identifying tables with long vacuum times. That's how we're, we're using vacuum time as an indicator for our partitioning efforts, because that is a big impact on our CPU saturation. Uh, much more than actually storing the data. So that's that's the direction we're going there. And on the other side, we're also working on the query reporting, uh, which we'll talk more about in a later section because that's kind of a wider effort. Um, but we're we're working on leveraging query reporting in order to observe how partitioning changes queries uh, and make sure that partitioning won't have an outsized impact on those queries. Cool. Yeah. And then the next item here also been around for a little bit is updating our primary keys to big int. Um, a lot of this was waiting on a lot of backfills and migrations over multiple milestones, but I think we, we're finally reaching a point where we can start tidying some of these areas for GitLab SaaS. I think an important part to note here is that our efforts to mitigate primary keys for GitLab SaaS have spanned, I think, four or five milestones now end to end, but they do not address self-managed. So self-managed instances do not have the same magnitude of risk because they simply do not run as large in terms of traffic and users and volume. But we do want to mitigate this as well for them, both so that both SaaS and .com are using the same database structures, um, but also at some point they will hit this problem. Yeah. Um, that's, we're, we're very, very close for mitigating gitlab.com. The, the biggest holdup here has been events, uh, which was referencing notes, which had this issue. And we're very close to having that swapped. All the backfilling is done. We're really just 
getting, I think the final swap went up into a merge request for GitLab.com uh, yesterday or earlier this week. And the well, we sh after that's done, we should be able to clean up the column and GitLab.com should no longer be at risk of any primary keys over 50% saturation. Um, another thing that's kind of going on at the same time is we've been working with the scalability group to improve monitoring and alerting. One of the reasons that events took a little bit longer is we got a later start on it. We got a later start because the column wasn't an ID column. And so it wasn't automatically identified by our monitoring as being at risk. Uh, we've addressed that with some new queries to drive the monitoring and we're just working on getting that merged in. So um, we have that assigned to a DRI from their team and we're hoping to get that over the finish line um, early on in 16.3. Cool. That's super exciting to hopefully close this out, at least for SaaS and, and mitigate a big risk item. So next up is our automated database testing. This has been something that I know the team's been really excited on and working through on a lot of different directions. Previously, we worked through and had some technical architecture designs to sort of plan out how this might look. I know some of the query analysis here also touches on what we talked about just a little bit earlier. Alex, did you wanna dive a bit deeper on here? Yeah, you know, we're we there's some really exciting things. Um, the team changed directions a little bit last milestone in terms of how they thought they uh, about how we were going about collecting these queries, and they found a way that's much more efficient and really pretty brilliant. Uh, and I'm excited to see that move forward. We've had a little trouble getting it merged because of um, a, a variety of pipeline failures and conflicts from other changes within the pipeline structures. But we're really hoping to get this first uh, phase one of the automated query analysis merged uh, either the very end of this last milestone or very early next milestone. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to move on to phase two, which is actually getting out a list of added queries for a merge request uh, that we put up. And that's really going to enable us to do a really neat stuff, not just extracting things to make reviews easier, but we'll also be able to do analysis on those queries to make sure that they meet our guidelines um, and, and help inform people what guidelines they should be using to review those queries also. Yeah. And this has been, I think, really important for us because we've been trying for a long time to make sure our database queries perform in, in a performant way, but we don't really know what queries exist or are being called each time we make some changes. And so it's hard to optimize when we don't know what the impact is. So this, this is a key part in visibility. Um, so lastly, we've got some smaller focused items here um, in terms of background processing and migrations. I know we've been also working through some of these for a few milestones as well, but I think some of these are getting closer. Did you want to touch on that too? Yeah, you know, safe background processing took, uh, Prava had some leave and we decided not to reassign it while he was, uh, had limited availability. And so that kind of has been on hold while he's pursued a, a variety of other priorities kind of simultaneously. Uh, so that hasn't had a lot of progress in 16.2. In 16.3, we're really hoping to get one of these checks implemented and so that we can see how it's resulting. I know Prava has been in touch with a couple of different groups about adding them. So um, we're really excited to see that move forward. Um, for migration versions running in milestone, not version order, there's a spike up for that now. Um, Kraus put together the first iteration of this uh, and he's getting feedback from the team before he goes on leave for a few weeks and hands that over to uh, John to kind of take the first issues out of that spike and move them over the finish line, so. Yeah, and this will be particularly helpful as we're looking to generally improve the upgrade experience for customers who are jumping milestones and minimizing a, a known risk factor for upgrade failure. Yeah, this effectively will bring our customers who are doing multi-milestone upgrades they it, whereas right now those uh, my uh, their migrations run in version order so that doesn't consider milestone at all it just considers 
literally the time a timestamp from when the migration was created by a developer on their laptop. So it could be that a six month old branch gets merged with old timestamps and the timestamps line up with, you know, 15.8 and they get merged into 16.3, right? We're trying to avoid that for, from now on. And at a, to a lesser extent, it, or a greater extent, I should say, more often it's, you know, 16.1 and 16.2 and 16.2 and 16.3 will be a little bit mingled together. But this change will make it so that every customer will run, whether you're doing downtime migrations or no downtime upgrades, you will run your migrations in the same order as everybody else. And we're hoping that that'll prevent not only a, a whole bunch of bugs, but it'll also leave customer, if there are problems, it leaves customers in a state where they're still compatible with a single version, which is not really the case right now. Yeah. So that's a great note to end on. Thank you, Alex. And yeah, yeah. this is database planning 16.3. Thanks, everybody.